there are probably a million things that you would rather be doing outside. Um, but we do have an opportunity to talk about something that's sort of a little utilized part of marketing for most uh, brands or businesses. And it's kind of a shame. It's this sort of missing piece that once you get the hang of it, once you've done it a few times, it really streamlines your work and makes things much easier down the line. Um, so I always love to introduce people to the concept of an editorial calendar. So we're going to talk about what that editorial calendar is, what it does for you, how you can actually create one for your business. And I'm going to go over some tools that are useful in calendar creation. Um, and just a little a brief bit about me, I have been in and around the Berkshires for many, many years, something like 25 years now. So if you have run into me at a networking meeting or something like that, um, hello, nice to see you again. Um, I have worn a variety of different hats, started out as a journalist and then came over to the dark side of marketing because they have better cookies and the work is more plentiful. Um, so I have been in marketing for about 15 years now. I've worked for a variety of different brands and businesses. I was also on staff with Annie Selke Companies for about five years right in Pittsfield. I was the managing editor of digital and social media. So that is one of the primary positions where I came to my know-how about how these different pieces function within social media, within your uh, your earned paid and owned media landscape. Um, and if you don't know those terms, you are welcome to ask me and we will talk about all of that stuff. So we're going to get going on our editorial calendar right now. I'm going to actually be working from two screens. So if you see me looking off into the distance, I swear I'm still here. I'm just looking at my other screen so that I've got my notes in front of me. So without further ado, here we go. So my first question is, does this look familiar to anybody? And if this is you sitting in front of the computer every day, wondering what you're gonna post on social media today, I have great news for you. You do not have to endure you know, the agony of the screen. If anybody knows that reference, then you're as old as me. Um, but if you are doing this every day, you're pulling your hair out and you're thinking, oh my God, I don't know what to put on Facebook. I have to have something different for Instagram. What am I gonna put there? What do I put on my blog or in my email? I've got really good news for you. We're gonna talk about how to make that process so much easier so that you will not be spending any time, I hope, doing this anymore. So let's keep it moving forward. So we're gonna talk about what is an editorial calendar. And an editorial calendar, it's used to define and control the process of uh, content creation. So it starts with ideas and goes all the way through the writing and publication process. And I know that sounds super complicated, but it's not. I mean, the writing of a post, for example, on Facebook, and then the publication of a post are basically a one or two steps away from each other. So it really is nothing complicated. The editorial calendar you're looking at here is actually one that I had downloaded online from Minnesota Business Magazine. And this is just sort of a sample of what an editorial calendar might look like. A lot of magazines employ them. So we sort of stole the concept from the magazine world because they did such a great job of organizing and compartmentalizing all of their content. So then when it came time to publish a particular issue, they knew exactly what was going to go into it. So you can see here, if you look in January, for example, they have a focus on women's leadership. Um, it says a focus on women's leaders, trailblazers, blazers, and emerging leaders in various industries. And then they have some other content topics beneath that that they're going to publish in. Hey, Robin. And, yeah. Sorry, I don't think you're sharing your screen yet. I'm not? I can't see the editorial calendar. Oh, all right. Hold on one second. I thought I was sharing. That's okay. Let's back up. Can you see this? No. Good God, what's going on? It was working a minute ago. <laughs> Technology. Ah, wait. There we go. <laughs> All right, awesome. Cool. So <laughs> now you people are probably thinking, is she insane? What was she talking about earlier? <laughs> I'll show you very quickly what I was talking about earlier. So this is the image when I was talking about the agony of the screen. This is it. And this is what we want to prevent you from doing, which is pulling your hair out. So now moving forward, here we are with our handy editorial calendar downloaded from Minnesota Business Magazine. And you can see all of their different content topics. So as I was mentioning, you know, you could look at any of them, really. I was just using January as an example. Um, but what they've got going on here 
is, you know, they, they have this sort of overarching topic, which is women's leadership. And then within that, they can have a variety of different subtopics or, uh, yeah, let's call them subtopics, keep things smoother for now. So they might have something on, you know, an article on women business leaders under 40 or a Q&A on mentorship for women, women in business, um, how recent legislation affects women's pay. Any of these kinds of topics can fit within that broader overarching category of women's leadership. And this is how we want to think. We wanna start with these kind of broad ideas and then narrow down to smaller topics to make it easier for our audience to kind of follow along with us. And I'm not suggesting that you need to be super specific like these guys, like you don't have to have a single category that you're focusing on each month. This is just to give you an idea of how you can kind of organize your calendar according to themes and topics that actually resonate with your audience. So now moving forward, and you can still see that, right? Okay, awesome. Um, so we're going to talk about how an editorial calendar actually benefits a business. And a good editorial calendar helps you identify content that's of interest to your customers and provide it during peak engagement cycles. And what we mean by that is basically when customers or clients are most likely to purchase your products or services. So you don't have to have a physical product. You can also be a service provider. But any industry that you're in has a peak engagement cycle, and that's when people are most likely to reach out and purchase your services. It also allows you to determine where to publish your content. So you can look at different channels or platforms. And when we're talking about digital marketing specifically, that's generally website, blog, social media, and email. All of these are fair game when it comes to creating an editorial calendar. And in fact, you want to think about all of these in sort of a holistic way. And I know that is a very overused buzzword, so apologies for that. But you want to think about your marketing in a way that's not just this one little thing. You're not just focusing on your Facebook marketing. You're focusing on all of your digital marketing and Facebook fits within it, just like all of your other channels and platforms do. And it does not matter to me if you have one social media platform that you are on or you have five. Doesn't matter at all. When you're creating an editorial calendar, you can create it for all of those different buckets. Again, another overused buzzword. Marketing loves buzzwords, by the way. So you're going to hear me use a few of those today. Um, but anyway, what we're doing with this content calendar is making sure we take the guesswork out of posting so we don't have any of those days where we're, we're sitting there racking our brains over what we're going to put out today. It will make your day-to-day -day workflow a lot easier. And it also allows you to get ahead. As we saw with that previous slide with the editorial calendar from the magazine, they actually have theirs done for an entire year. You do not need to do this. I usually recommend thinking at like three to four months at a time is kind of ideal. And the reason you want to do this is because number one, you've got those peak engagement cycles that we've just talked about. And number two, it kind of runs seasonally. So if you have a business that is at all hooked into what's going on seasonally, this is an opportunity for you to make sure that you've got content that's covering all of those different um, times of the year that are really important for your business. And as I've got here in nice bold type so you don't forget it, a small investment of time in creating this calendar is actually going to save you a ton of time later. So I know it probably sounds like a lot to think about spending half a day. And by that, I mean three or four hours. I don't mean literally half a day. Um, but if you put down three, three to four hours, just sort of brainstorming and coming up with this calendar for three to four months at a time, you know, do that once a quarter you're going to realize major benefits later on because you're going to find out that you don't have to do as much work later to kind of scramble to put those pieces together. So why else do you want to use an editorial calendar? Well, content marketing is increasingly important, both in building and retaining an audience and in affecting your rank in search. And I'm sure everybody here has heard about SEO, uh, search engine optimization, super, super important in anything we're doing in the digital marketing landscape. Content marketing is a really important piece of that. And you will definitely hear um, from a lot of people that you know you should be focusing on social media, for example. And social media is an extremely useful tool. I will not dissuade you from using it. But what I will tell you is that content marketing, which you can usually accomplish through your blog and your website, and 
potentially even other channels. If, for instance, you post on LinkedIn, um, if you like to blog on Medium, any of those kinds of other channels, if you're utilizing any of these, you're actually doing a lot more for your search engine optimization and your content marketing as a whole by using these sorts of um, publishing platforms to get the word out. The reason why social media is not necessarily as strong from a content marketing perspective is just because the feed refreshes so quickly. So what you see on one day, especially on a microblogging platform like Twitter, which is like constant refreshment of the feed, those things get bumped down the feed very, very quickly. So your post may stay up for a few hours for somebody to see, not so much on Twitter, on the other platforms for sure. Um, but after that, it's gonna get bumped down in the feed and nobody's gonna see it anymore. Unless for some reason you, you know, a post of yours has gone viral or a lot of people are replying to it, commenting on it. That's one way to bump it up in the feed on social media. But without that happening, you have this other option. You have content marketing through your blog and your website, and that is super important. And I definitely urge you to use these. So an editorial calendar is gonna help you here. It's also gonna give you a very specific goal to work toward. And the reason we want that is because it makes marketing communications much more cohesive. So we are broadcasting the same message across different platforms at the same time, instead of just sort of a haphazard approach of one thing on one platform, one thing on another, you want to basically give the customer a similar experience, no matter where they're experiencing your brand. So we like an editorial calendar that makes everything feel a lot more professional and organized and puts out that same message just one at a time. Um, it's also easier to repurpose your content. And we're going to talk a little later about effective repurposing of content. And you can create a cross promotion plan on social media. And I would be willing to bet that some of your workshops are going to talk about cross promotion on social media, which is another one of my very favorite things in the whole world, because it gives you an opportunity to make sure that you're getting those key messages out on different platforms. So that if a customer is following you in one place on Facebook, for example, um, you also want to see if you can attract customers to Instagram, to Twitter, to YouTube. So being able to cross promote on these channels and put out the same, uh, the similar message with not the same wording, let's put it that way. We're going to talk about that in a little bit too. Um, an editorial calendar also makes it easier for you to connect with other brands or businesses, the media or influencers that you might want to work with. And the reason for that is you're going to have an idea of when that collaboration works for you. So if you know, for example, that you are, uh, let's say you have a, an eco-friendly jewelry brand and you know that Mother's Day is a big holiday for you, you can make sure you've got that on your, your um, editorial calendar so that you are actually contacting other businesses in the area that you might like to partner with, say, if you're doing a Mother's Day giveaway, um, if you're contacting the media to let them know about about a new jewelry line that's coming up or a new promotion for Mother's Day, you have the time to do this because you've already set it up in advance. You're not just blasting things out the day before and hoping that people come around. So it's a really effective way to communicate uh, really important messages to your core client base or your core customers. And an editorial calendar can also increase revenue generation by a lot, believe it or not, because we are tapping into those peak engagement cycles. So I hope I'm giving you a, a pretty decent interview here, uh, oh, sorry, overview here. And I just wanted to go back for one second because I mentioned that term content marketing. Is everybody familiar with that? Or Michaela, do you think it's worth my giving a, a quick overview on what content marketing is? It's worth mentioning. Okay. All right. So... According to the Content Marketing Institute, and yes, there actually is one of those, content marketing is the marketing and business process for creating and distributing relevant and valuable content to attract, acquire, and engage a clearly defined and understood target audience with the objective of driving profitable customer action. So basically, you want the right people at the right time with the right message, hopefully so that they will buy something from you. So that's what we're looking at with content marketing. So now I'm going to give you uh, a few calendar tools that might be useful to you. 
This first one is called co-schedule and I will tell you upfront, it is for folks who have extra money to burn on it. So, you know, if you've gotten a grant or if you had a, a nice flood of cash come in over some recent promotion you did, Co-Schedule is very, very cool. It has a ton of bells and whistles. It integrates with your WordPress website. If you have WordPress, I think it might also integrate with uh, Squarespace. Um, it has a variety of different calendar views and coding for different social platforms. So you can see here on this example, like if you look at Tuesday, there's that little icon for Twitter after eight, or right beside 8 a.m. And that's so that you can kind of have this at a glance knowing where all of these different content pieces are going. You can also assign tasks to teams. You can communicate with your team on the calendar itself. So very, very powerful and cool scheduling tool. It runs in the neighborhood of about $60 a month for the most basic plan. So that is cost prohibitive for a lot of people. And if that is not for you, don't worry, we've got more. So what we've got here is, this is my very favorite and you're probably gonna laugh because you're gonna think it's really basic, but this is Google Calendar and pretty much everybody has it. If you have a Google account, you have access to Google Calendar. And why I love Google Calendar so much is because you can do a ton of things with it. If you look at this sample calendar here, you can actually color code the crap out of it so that you know exactly what everything is. And we could assign say, you know, this green right here could be website. The yellow would be email. Maybe this burgundy color is Facebook, and then the red could be Twitter. So you can color code it so that everything is quick and at a glance, like you had with CoSchedule, but in a free platform. So it's a really, really useful uh, calendaring uh, program to use. You can do a bunch of different things with it. You can look at month, week, or day views. You don't have to stick to just one single view. This is the month view that we've got on the screen right now. If you click onto any one of these individually, it opens up this really nice big notes field. I love the notes field because you can store a ton of stuff in there. I usually will store links to articles that I want to refer back to. I occasionally will actually put an entire email in there. If somebody sent me an email that I need to remember, but I don't necessarily need to reply to, I can copy and paste the entire email right into that notes field. And I don't know about you, but I really love a clean email box. And I am constantly in pursuit of an email box that doesn't go past that first page I haven't gotten there in a while, but I'm trying. Um, so if you are also like me and you want to try, to try to keep things as organized as possible, it can be really helpful to just sort of drag those emails onto the calendar for later reference. So you're not having to sort through them in your email box, which we all know when it gets out of control and you're trying to find something, it is just a hairy mess. So highly advocate for that. You can also set up reminders. I live by reminders these days. I think the pandemic just knocked that up by a few notches for me. I felt like I was forgetting things right and left unless I had a reminder set. So you set a reminder, you can get that reminder by email, you can get it as a little ping to your cell phone, you can set it up however you like, and you can set up as many as you want, which is also handy. So if something super important is coming up, you can set up that reminder to go off, you know, an hour or two before you need it, and then again, 10 minutes before, um, or you can just do it once if you're really good about responding to those notifications. Um, and you can share your calendar. So if you've got collaborators in your brand or business that you're going to be working with, you can share your calendar with all of your different team members. And now we're going to look at MS Outlook. This is another one that most people seem to have, especially if you work in an office environment. Outlook is really, really handy. It has a lot of those same uh, or similar functions as a Google Calendar. You can color code your entries. You can do month, week, or day view. You can drag and drop emails on Outlook, which I love. You can actually just, you know, touch that email, press on it, long press, and then drag it over to your calendar, and it will stay right on the, the day that you asked it to stay on. You can drag it into your task list, too, which is pretty cool. So again, if you want to store all of your stuff in one place so that you're not constantly sorting in different places to look for it, this is a great way to do it. What we're looking at here is the tabbed view. 
um, on MS Outlook. And this is useful if you have several different calendars that you want to keep separate. You don't want to overlay them. Google Calendar will do this too, but you have to toggle back and forth between them. So you'll see one calendar at a time in Google unless you decide to consolidate them um, and let it show you all of the calendars overlaid on top of each other. MS Outlook, I don't believe has the option to overlay the calendars on top of each other, but you can look at them in this tabbed view and see what's due when or when you're supposed to be putting up a particular blog post or newsletter. Um, and you can also set up reminders and task, list, task lists, just like you can in Google Calendar. And this is Trello. I don't know if any of you folks have used Trello. Super user friendly, a really, really good tool to have. There is a free version. The free version doesn't have quite as many bells and whistles as the paid version, but it still does a lot. And the paid version is actually pretty inexpensive. It runs about $10 a month for the base plan. So if you decide you really like Trello, you've used the free version and you want to upgrade, it's not super prohibitive. Um, but anyway, you can start with free. And I always advocate starting with free because why spend money if you don't need to? So I would definitely urge you to take a look at uh, Trello. This is actually a content calendar that I had created when I was on staff at the any Selkie companies for the blog. And as you can see here, we've got the color coding again. In this case, we color coded according to categories. So for instance, the orange that you see here was a DIY category. Um, the purple was kind of this generic we love category, and then green was tips. So on and on. You can kind of create your own um, color coding system. You can color code according to platforms or topics, doesn't matter which way. The best thing that works for your business is the best way to do it. But I like Trello because you've got the option to drag and re reorder all of these really easily. You can do that in um, Outlook and Google Calendar, not quite as seamlessly. But with Trello, if I wanted to just click on one of these and drag it somewhere else to reorder it, I could do that. It's super simple. And you can also have team members add comments and check off tasks. And we're going to take a quick look at what that looks like. So this is it. Pretend I clicked on one of these these little cards right here. It brings up this view where you can put in a little description of what it is. You can add labels or tags. You can add team members right here. So if there's more than one person who's going to be working with you on your projects, you can add them here. You can attach photos, documents, anything you need to refer back to later for this particular piece of content, you can put right here. And then you can also add a checklist at the bottom. So, you know, as you can see, you sort of check off as you go. So if somebody on the team has done a couple of parts of the project, they can go ahead and check that off and you know immediately what still needs to be done. So Trello, I really like it. I think it's super useful. It, you don't need to have any kind of um, knowledge of different apps to use it. It's like a really very easy learning curve. So if this is something that you think might be interesting to you for your business, I would definitely tell you to go ahead and take a look at it. Another one is called Cloud Cal. This one is a little bit more recent, the last four, maybe five years or so. I believe it's available for both Android and iPhone. Um, again, you can color code your entries, you can do different views month, week or day. It also has a large notes field, which you can see right here on this little third image. And the circles, this is what's kind of unique about CloudCal. It has these circles that basically show you how busy your day is or how much has been completed on a project. So if we're looking, see on the second here, that one has been completed in full. If you go down to the ninth, there's this little chunk that isn't done yet. Some folks find this to be a really, really useful visual reference. Like, oh, I want to look at my, uh, you know, what's due for me, and I want to have an at a glance view of it. I want to make sure that I'm getting all of my tasks done. And so this ends up being a really good tool, especially for visual learners. I tend to be more of a language learner, so this doesn't work for me as well as some of the other calendars. Um, but certainly it's something that you can use and it is free, I think, for a version that has ads. And then you can also purchase a version, I believe it's a one time purchase as opposed to a monthly subscription. And it's pretty minimal, I want to say it was under $10. So it, it, again, something to look into if you feel like this is something that could be useful to your business. 
And then this is one last one I wanted to show you. This is the WordPress editorial calendar plugin. And this is sort of a clunky, slightly older view of it. I couldn't find a better capture on screen for it. Um, but again, we've got the idea of, you know, we've got our month and week view. You can drag these. I can press on this and drag it to another part of the calendar. You can also quick edit posts. So if you have a blog or a website on um, WordPress, you can actually click into one of these. You can change the title. You can change the content. You can change the publishing time all from this calendar uh, plugin itself, which is, you know, it's very handy if you don't want to be spending a lot of your time figuring out different functions on the back end of your website. Um, you can also manage multiple posts from multiple authors, which is kind of nice. So if you've got several contributors on your team who are all putting stuff onto your calendar, you can go and review them all here. Um, it's a nice way to make sure that you're not having to, you know, dig through your email and find one email from Robin, one email from Michaela. Um, you know, you get everything right here ready to go for you. And if all of this seems like, you know what, this is too much, I am so not interested in any of these. That's cool. We've also got an analog calendar and you can totally use this. I still use checklists like paper checklists for a lot of stuff. I am a big bullet journal fan. So even though I do have a Google calendar that has all of my important notifications and really sort of like the stuff that I cannot possibly forget goes on my Google calendar because I want those reminders to ping me every now and then. But I also have sort of like a daily task list that I check off on paper. If you like paper, if you're an artist, if you are somebody who really enjoys the process of, you know, being able to monitor how much you've accomplished in a day, I definitely advocate for this. There's, there's nothing wrong with it being, you know, a, a little bit old school because sometimes old school is good. So now we're going to go over uh, the mechanics of calendar creation. And I'm just going to pause really quickly for a second and see if anybody has any questions before I move forward. You can either feel free to raise your hand or just turn on your mic and ask. And if not, I'll go forward. OK, cool. All right, so we're going to keep going. So we're going to talk about how you're actually going to put together your editorial calendar. So this is sort of your broad overview. We're going to determine topics. We're going to create a color coding system for either categories or platforms. Um, we're going to talk about creating detailed notes, and that includes everything from headline ideas to article links, things you want to refer back to later, um, things that you can put in that notes field and save for later use without having to scrounge around and find where you saved them elsewhere. Um, we'll also drag, attach, or copy pertinent emails onto the calendar for later ref reference so you're not sifting through your old messages. You want to share your calendar with team members and set up reminders or create task lists to kind of keep you on track to make sure that those things are not just idle entries on a calendar, they're things that you actually accomplish. So step one of creating an editorial calendar is to brainstorm content around topics and not keywords. And what I mean by that is, so if you have, let's say, I'm going to go with, uh, I'll go back to my Annie Selkie roots. So let's go with uh, home decor is sort of a category. It's wide, right? You could write about a whole bunch of things in that. So you don't want to put home decor on your calendar because that could mean a thousand things. And it could mean a thousand things to a thousand different people. So you need to drill down on that a little bit. So instead of home decor, we're going to think more along the lines of topics. So something like creating a welcoming outdoor space, that's still relatively broad, but it's a lot narrower than where we started, or decorating with the color blue, um, making cozy decor for winter. So you see where I'm going with this? It could be any variety of things. It's just a little bit narrower than that giant category that we started with because it's really hard to create engaging content around a giant category. Also, giant categories do not rank well in search. And the reason for that is the giant companies out there, the Cokes and Nikes and JCPenney's, um, they have bought up all of those keywords and made them super, super competitive. So if you were to try to rank and search for the words home decor, you would have a really, really hard time doing it because JCPenney is already doing it. So we want to make sure that we're drilling down into topics um, instead of just these broad ideas. So in this first step, you can go ahead and 
jot down a broad idea like home decor, but you immediately want to start coming up with other ideas underneath it. So jot down whatever comes to you. I don't care if you do this on paper or on your screen. Either way, you're going to throw out some of these ideas. You're going to end up thinking that they're not worth pursuing, and that's okay. It's always better to have too many than too few. So go ahead and write down as many as you want. So that's your first step is just to brainstorm. And if you are really super stuck and you don't know what to do, you have no idea what kind of uh, topic you want to write about, a really nice little cheat is this website called answerthepublic.com. So you can go to answerthepublic.com and in the search bar, you can type in something rather broad. So in this case, I typed in home decor and it comes up with a whole bunch of things. It comes up with uh, home decor projects, um, how to now some of these are worded a little grammatically strange, but you know it's the internet. How to make home decor crafts, how wide is home decor fabric, how to choose home decor style. So it's got a bunch of nice little prompts. And it, it doesn't mean that you have to follow them if you don't like them, but this is a really, really good way if you're stuck and you don't see a way forward, you know you want to write about something, but you're not really sure what. Use a site like this. And these are actually things that people are typing into search. So it gives you a good idea of what people are looking for, what kind of questions they want answered when they go online. And anytime you can answer questions that people are typing in search, that's gold for you. So I definitely say use this website whenever you need to. Uh, it's there, it's free, you can use it at any time. Step two is going to be to look at the annual calendar and make note of holidays and other important events that are, are related to your industry. So again, we're going to go back to that idea of, you know, making, uh, you're a jewelry maker. So for a jewelry maker, your important days of the year are going to be major holidays for gift giving. So that's going to be Christmas, maybe a little bit New Year's, Valentine's Day, Mother's Day. Those are sort of your key opportunities to uh, put the content out there that's important on a, a calendar basis that's important seasonally to your, your customers. You can extend this to other types of businesses. So I've got a couple of examples here. Say you own a home cleaning business, then you want to be tapped into the idea of spring cleaning or fall cleaning or creating a, an organized dorm room for a college student who's going back to school. So think about those dates on the calendar that are super important to your business and plug those in. So those are going to be the first things that actually go on your calendar um, and you're going to build your other content around that. And the reason is we want to make sure that we are hitting those peak engagement cycles. We want to be talking to people when they are interested in hearing from us. So that's why you're going to put these things on the calendar first. And also keep timing in mind. So I've got an example here, you know, if you're doing a post about how to style the Thanksgiving table for company, you don't want to run that on Thanksgiving because people need time to actually purchase the supplies or, you know, try the how-to themselves. So you want to make sure you're running any of that kind of important content a good two weeks before it's actually needed. So a Thanksgiving post should go up two weeks before Thanksgiving. Step three is to try plugging in a few silly holidays. And these are really goofy, but people love them. So I say go for it. You can find a listing of them at holidayinsights.com slash more holidays. And they have everything. There's, you know, National Compliment Day, Ask a Stupid Question Day, National Chocolate Chip Cookie Day. There's even Sleep in a Hammock Day. They're pet days, like everything you can think of, I guarantee you will be able to find at least one that is semi-related to your business and you can definitely use it. There are very few businesses where humor doesn't work. You know, if you're a doctor's office or a lawyer, yeah, you maybe want to be careful about deploying the humor. Um, but any other business, humor is usually a really, really powerful tool and people appreciate it. They just want a little levity in their day. So it never hurts to give them something that's a little bit fun or, you know, exciting. You can also look at uh, local holidays. And the example I have here is Founders Day, which is in Lee. They've been doing it forever. There are probably tons of similar local holidays or festivals. You know, if there's a local garlic festival or arts festival, you can definitely tap into that as well. That can be part of your editorial calendar. 
Step four is to add industry events, conferences, and happenings. So again, we're thinking about things that are relevant to your industry. I've got a home decor example here. Um, this was, you know, in 2016, Pantone released probably their two best colors of the year. They've all been kind of ugly since then. Um, but they released these two colors of the year. So we ran a variety of different posts that were talking about the Pantone colors of the year. So that's not going to be, you know, necessarily appropriate for your business if you run a restaurant, but that's okay. There's tons of stuff in your industry that you can tap into. Um, and, you know, if we're speaking about food, one of the best things that you can tap into is the harvest season. So when different products are coming into harvest, you know, strawberries in June, blueberries in July, squash in the fall and the winter. So all of these things can be used as content either in and of themselves or just something that you can hook into to remind people like, oh, the harvest is, is coming. Have you thought of recipes for, you know, the strawberries that you just bought? And you can also think about um, things that show your expertise. So conferences and industry events can be important for that. If you are attending a conference or speaking at a conference, um, this is something that shows the audience that you are an authority and what you do, not necessarily that you expect them to attend, but that they, they understand that this is something that you, know, you can really speak authoritatively on. So step five, <clears throat> add in new product or service releases and sales or promos. And you wanna do this as planfully, I hate that word, but as planfully as you can, because when we sort of haphazardly throw a sale or promo out there last minute, it sometimes works, it often flops. So if you do this in a way where you say to yourself, okay, I wanna make sure I have two major sales or promos per year and maybe two minor ones, then you look at the calendar and determine where you wanna place them. When you do that, you're able to back out your posts your emails, everything else. <coughs> Excuse me, one second. All right, <clears throat> sorry about that. It's super dry in here today. <clears throat> All right, <clears throat> pardon me. All right, let's get back to, <clears throat> oh, I went forward too far, didn't I? This is the one, yep. Okay. <clears throat> Michaela, am I still sharing or do I need to uh, redo it? You're good. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Now, if I can stop coughing for five seconds. Oh, good Lord. Sorry, guys. Every time I do the slideshow, it goes back to the beginning. Okay. Anyway, <clears throat> so with any sort of product or service releases or sales and promos, in addition to just the thing itself, we want to make sure there's some sort of storytelling aspect behind it because customers respond to stories. They don't respond just to things. A person isn't going to be interested in buying, <clears throat> for example, your makeup line just because it's a makeup line. They're going to be interested in buying it because it's good for your skin or it's made for women over 40. So there has to be something behind the actual product or service instead of just throwing out a message that says, hey, Cosmetics on sale, $10. That's not enough. So instead of just cosmetics on sale, $10, it could be, hey, fall colors. Look at this new range of fall colors we have. Or have you, uh, have you uh, looked at the, the looks that were at, I don't know, the most recent um, award show? And I know the Oscars doesn't happen in the fall. Emmys, Emmys happens in the fall. So you could say, you know, have you seen the makeup looks at the Emmys? Do you want to know how to get them? Here, we can help you get them. And by the way, take 10% off. So make sure you're always incorporating that idea of storytelling behind any kind of messaging that you're putting out there and you're gonna have a much better result. Step six, fill in with evergreen content. 
And by evergreen content, I mean content that is good at any time of the year. It's not related to anything on the calendar. It's not particularly hooked into the news cycle. It's just stuff that you could run at any time and it will still be, it'll still feel fresh. So these can be tips, ideas, or inspiration that the reader can try at home. It can be behind the scenes of you working. Behind the scenes is super powerful if you run a visually oriented business. If you are an artisan, say you make leather goods, you can you know, shoot a little iPhone video of you 10, 20 seconds working in the studio. And that's something that people love to see because that peek behind the curtain is very, very alluring. So anytime you can think about that, you know, if you're doing a photo shoot with uh, dogs on your brand new rugs, then you can do a behind the scenes of the photo shoot and show all those cute puppies romping around and people will love that as well. You can talk about the inspiration or history behind a product or an art or craft technique. You can talk about interesting ways to use your product. And one of my favorite for this, uh, there was a company that they just folded recently. Their name was Hudson Standard and they used to make these drinking shrubs. So, you know, like uh, flavored vinegars that you could put into your water or tea, but they would send around these great emails about how you could use the drinking shrub in cocktails, in salad dressing, in baked goods, like a bunch of things that I never would have thought of using it for that reason. I just thought about like, oh yeah, it's great in my seltzer. It makes my seltzer taste like soda. Um, they had this really great forward thinking approach of, yeah, but you can also use it in all of these other ways that are really, really beneficial. So try to think about those kinds of things. Again, we're thinking about content that revolves around topics, not just keywords or items. And I just wanna show you here in the sidebar here, you see this five ways to style a scarf. This is actually one that we did for the Annie Selkie companies. This is a great um, look at evergreen content because it's something that we could run at any time of the year and it works. So we started it as a blog post. It was a much longer blog post that had a lot of this information in it and additional photos. We then sent it out as an email, which is what you're looking at here, which is kind of an abbreviated version. And then we broke it up into three or four different tips that we ran on social media. So that's an example of one piece of content that we repurposed several different ways. So it's you do the work once and then you break it down and you've got a whole bunch of content that you can use on different platforms. So it's just a really smart way of working without having to do a ton of extra work. And moving to the next one, we've got talking about great content you've read elsewhere. This is something that just shows that you are plugged into your field, that you're knowledgeable about what's going on in the world around you, um, that you know what's going on in your industry. And you can definitely give a shout out to friends, you know, friendly businesses, other people that you want to promote. That's always a good thing to do. But you want to focus the majority of your efforts on people who or businesses who are a little bit higher profile than you are. They don't have to have a following of 5 million people. Um, but certainly somebody who has a larger audience than you might be able to take you along for the ride. So, you know, if you can make sure that you're giving them a shout out, if you're linking to something interesting they did, if there's something on uh, somebody's blog that you want to call out, you can post about that on your own social media, in your email, uh, on your website if you want to, just so that you're showing that you, are, you have a focus that's a little bit wider than just yourself, because nobody really appreciates somebody who's completely self turned inward. Um, we want to make sure that you're looking out to the outside. And that goes for stuff that's going on in the news cycle. Uh, a really good example of this, I have a friend who runs a business um, that makes products or like self-help products for women that have experienced miscarriages. And when Chrissy Teigen, who is, I think, the person with the most Twitter followers ever or something crazy like that, when she posted last year about a miscarriage that she had suffered, there was a great outpouring of support for women who had experienced something similar. My friend was able to say, absolutely, you know, and we are here for, for women who are going through this. You know, let us know if we can help you in some way. It was not a hard sell. It wasn't buy our products. Um, it was more like, we're here for you. And that showed that she was paying attention to what was going on out there in the world. And she was able to tap into that and generate some sales from people who had actually experienced something similar. And down here, I've got a definition of influencer. If you are familiar with the term, you don't quite know what it means. If you've never heard it before, either way, I've got a little definition of it. Um, it's basically just somebody who has a really large following, generally on social media. 
um, and they are able to sort of drive purchasing decisions by virtue of being a tastemaker. Influencers have actually been around for a very, very long time. Um, we are really only hearing this word now related to social media, but influencers go way back when. Like, you know, Ben Franklin was probably the world's first content marketer and influencer. He had a tremendous amount of pull with people. They trusted what he said. And so they would make purchasing decisions based on, oh, well, Ben Franklin says in, you know, in uh, Poor Richard's Almanac that I should look out for these things. And so therefore I'm going to go buy what I need to make sure that you know my harvest is great this year. So influencers have been around for a long time. You don't have to hire them necessarily, but it's not a bad idea to network with them and see if they can potentially give you a side benefit of raising your profile. And we also want to think local. So like we were talking about with Founders Day in Lee or festivals that are going on in the area, um, if your product or service is available only or primarily to those within the local area, or if you have a brick and mortar store, you're location based, you want to plan at least one post a week that's about local news or happenings. The reason for this is just that you want to stay plugged into your local community. It's really important, especially for small businesses, to, you know, to, to really be involved in the local community and to feel like they are a part of that fabric. Um, so make sure that you are looking out for what's going on. You can, you know, subscribe to the Berkshire Eagle or the Berkshire Edge or Greylock Glass. Any of those guys have uh, great newsletters and you can find out what's going on around you and then talk about that when it's appropriate for your business. If your business is national or international, you still want to plan a couple of local interest posts per month. This just gives a sense of place for people. People like to think of businesses not just as these nameless, faceless entities, but as like living, breathing people almost. Um, and, you know, whether or not politically you like that idea, I think it's important to let people feel like there's a person behind the business instead of just this, you know, nameless, faceless facade. So those local posts give people a good idea of that. For repurposing content, you can repurpose it in your email newsletter. You can repurpose in abbreviated form on your website, like on the front page with a read more link. You know, it can be a little box that has a, an excerpt and a read more link. You can do best of the web, um, and those are roundups. Everybody's familiar with the term roundup, where it's, you know, say the, the 10 best new products this season, or um, our top trends for the year. With the, you do want to do end of the year roundups within the same year of your initial run date of the content. Um, you can rerun them later too, uh, as we see here. You can either do it as a throwback Thursday, believe it or not, is still a thing on social media. So you can do that TBT, or you can run it two or three years after the first run as if it's brand new. And I guarantee you, nobody is going to notice. Um, you can add new content to something. Now, this especially goes for a blog. You can add new content to a post that you've previously published and then add a line at the beginning that says something like, by popular demand, people asked for an update on this post. And so we're adding some additional details. You can also update the date on that post and bump it to the top of your blog so it looks like a brand new piece of content. Again, people are probably not going to remember that you ran this before. And the reason why this is a good thing to do is because search engines love new, they love novelty, they like updates. So if you update something on your blog, the search engine will automatically go and re-index that page. And you can also guest post on another blog on a related topic and, and include a link back to your blog, you know, the, uh, black, just your blog post. So for example, you do a how-to on indigo dyeing. So you have the how-to on your blog, you guest post on somebody else's blog about the history of Indigo Dye, and then you can link back to your own post. And this isn't limited to blogs. You can also do this on your social media. You can do it on uh, different platforms. You know, you can do it on Medium. You can link back to a post that you've created on your own site. And when to repurpose content. So you wanna choose one social media platform to promote on the day you run the material. So assuming that the material, let's just say that it comes from your blog originally because that's usually the easiest place to create a large quantity of content and then break it down for other purposes. So say you've posted on your blog. So that day you choose one social media platform to promote the blog post on. And then 
for the next seven to 10 days, you're going to rotate that information on different social media accounts. And these are just some examples here. You do not have to be on these social media channels. And if you are only on one social media channel and you do it really, really well, I am 100% on board with that. You don't need 10. You just need as many as you can do well. But this is just an example of how you can rotate through the different social media channels over a period of time so that people are seeing that content. And you'll notice that Twitter is here a lot. The reason for that is just that the name of the game is repetition on Twitter. And you can tweet about the same content, vary the copy a little bit just so that it's not exactly the same. You can do that up to 15 times over a 10 day period. And probably not much of your audience is gonna see that same post twice just because the feed refreshes so quickly. After that initial week to 10 day promo period, you wanna post again about once a month for three to four months. This is especially true of blog posts. Um, it's really good for you to do it on the same platform, the one that saw the most engagement the first time around, but you can also mix it up on different platforms. And it's just to generate new awareness and hopefully catch the pieces of the audience that didn't see it the first time around. When you're posting on social media in particular, this is really important because as we know with Facebook and Instagram, which is owned by Facebook, um, the algorithm makes it such that I think about 2% of what you post is seen by your audience. Uh, I'm sorry, that 2% of your audience sees any given post that you put out there. So reach is really, really poor on social media. And the way to kind of get around this is to post about something a few times. You just vary the content a little bit. You can switch out the image and you're good to go. And you can promote again after 12 to 18 months have passed just to kind of give it that final push before you move on. So that is my presentation. I know it's a lot of information. You don't have to remember it all at once. Happy to send you guys some slides that you can keep on hand. Um, and if you want to get in touch with me, you can reach me on my website, which is robinwriter.com. You can email me. I am happy to set up one-on-ones. Um, and yeah, if anybody has any questions, let's go ahead. Robin, I know you talked a lot about a different examples of um, content planning and, and repurposing. Um, can you maybe do an example of like, uh, we have someone from Cutting Edge Fitness here. Can you maybe do an example, quick, make a quick mock-up of like what sort of content they can post um, or maybe some example holidays, just something quick um, that would be useful for them? Yeah, so I would say for a fitness center, and this is like a general fitness center, not Pilates or yoga or something like that. Okay, for a general fitness center, I would say the first thing I would think of is New Year's because New Year's resolutions, right? Everybody eats too much over the holidays. And then New Year's resolutions, they're going to want to lose weight, get, get in shape, whatever. Uh, bikini season, again, not an official holiday, but that's the kind of thing people know summer's coming. They want to look good in their swimsuit on the beach. So those would be two prime holidays that you could tap into. You might also think about things like, you know about Valentine's Day. I sort of feel like that's unfeminist. I'm not sure if I want to say that. Um, but certainly there might be times of the year when people feel like they are overindulging and then they want to get fit. I would also think about if there is a segment of the audience that, um, you know, there are certain times of the year for them when fitness is a priority. And that might be, for example, runners. You know, runners are probably going to be super jazzed about the weather getting a little bit warmer because then they can get outside and go for longer distance runs. Um, so, you know, warm weather is kind of like a, a good idea for that. And then, sorry, did you want me to break it down into different platforms or? Um, yeah, I just, I'm trying to think of, you know, a lot of small businesses don't have time to maybe repurpose content, um, but what's maybe, you know, two platforms they should be using to repurpose content, even if they don't have time to, to set up an editorial calendar. Um, okay, so this might not be a very popular um, suggestion, but my, my personal opinion is that a blog is your absolute best tool for content marketing. Um, I feel like you can put your absolute best content there. It lives there forever or until you take it down and it will keep getting hits over time. And a really great example of this, uh, I listened to a guy named Marcus Sheridan, who he's now a motivational speaker. He started out as a pool salesman and he wrote a post about 15 years ago that was basically called, how much does it cost to put in an in-ground swimming pool? 
And he answered a question that nobody else wanted to answer because they felt like, I don't want to put my prices out there in public. Then people are going to think it's just this one thing. But he did it in a way that was basically, you know, saying, this is your base rate. If you're having, if you're, you know, building an in-ground pool, this is where you're going to start. This is what it's going to cost. And he went through all of that information. That post, which still is online, it has been viewed over 5 million times. So that's the kind of thing you put it out there and it will live there. It will keep getting traffic over and over again. And then you can link to it from your social media channels. You can link from your Facebook, your Instagram. Um, it's a little harder with Instagram, I understand, but there are tools for that too. And if you want tools for linking from Instagram to your website or anywhere else, let me know, I can help you. Um, you can talk about, you could make a YouTube video and then refer back to the post. So there's a lot of opportunity to make those cross promotion, uh, cross promotions work. And you can also break down the post. So remember that scarf post that I showed you guys, you know, that we did it as an email, we did it as a blog post, and then we broke it down into its component parts over social media. It's a really nice way to make sure you're kind of, you know, you're front loading the work, you're doing the work once, you're creating this longer piece of content, and then you're chunking it down so that you've got something to use over a period of a couple of weeks. You're not blowing all of your content just in one shot. Did that answer your question? Yes. Yep. That was awesome. very helpful. Does anyone have any examples or anything they want to talk to Robin about, maybe uh, experience wise? when uh, planning content or anything like that. I know this was helpful, helpful for me because I have a variety of clients. So um, it's kind of hard to source uh, captions and, and photos. And, you know, maybe if you're representing someone who uh, makes gravestones, <laughs> you can't necessarily use the national holidays as a, <laughs> well, as a starting you could. You'd have to have a really weird sense of humor for that. but. <laughs> Yeah. You never know. El Dia de los Muertos would be. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Jennifer asks, what are the tools for linking to Instagram that you just mentioned? Oh, so one that I like, which is free. And again, I am all about the free. If you want free tools, come to me. I am your free tool repository. The one I like is called Linktree. So just type in Linktree into Google and you will find the site. It basically is a little app that inter, uh, integrates with your Instagram account and it will create a link. So if you, if, if you want an example of this, you can go to my Instagram, which is once more to the shore. Um, and no, I am not an influencer, so don't laugh at me, but go to once more to the shore on Instagram and you'll see under my bio, there's a little thing that says link tree. And if you click on that, it will open another page that has a whole bunch of different links that you can click on. So for me, you know, this is my hat as a, a travel writer. Um, I have all of these different places where you can find my work. So you can do this for your link tree. You can link to product pages. You can link to services. Um, you can link to your work on other platforms. You know, if you are a guest contributor for a particular blog or publication. Um, I really, really like Linktree. There is an upgraded version with extra bells and whistles where you can customize the look of it more and do more things with it. You have to pay for it. I always like to start with the free thing and see how it works for me before I invest in it. And there are other tools as well. There are some that are more shopping oriented. And if you're interested in those, you can email me and I can, I'll dig out the list for you. I don't have it in front of me right now, but there are some that are better for more like um, if you sell products. But yeah, Linktree is a great tool. I like Linktree a lot because you don't have, you can just say link in bio and it's all right there. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I mean, we used to have to change that link in bio every single time we wanted people to click on it. And so the post would always end with, oh, you know, if you like this, click link in bio to go buy it. And it was, it's so clunky to have to do that every day. Right. And who wants to actually be on Instagram when they are posting? I am all about scheduling tools for social media. And there are a ton of those. I can also give you some, uh, some suggestions for those if you're looking for them. Um, but I think it's a really good idea to plan your content. 
uh, have you know sort of those topics already planned that you're going to be posting about and then you can spontaneously post on occasion when something interesting happens locally in the news cycle um, you know in the greater world that you want to tap into but this way you do not have to sit with your Instagram with your phone in front of you while you're at dinner with your family because oh my god I forgot to put something on Instagram today it's already going out while you sleep do you have maybe two or three scheduling tools you can mention off the top of your head? My favorite is Buffer. And again, they do have a free version, uh, more bells and whistles if you pay for it. And I think the paid version is 100 or maybe $120 a year. Um, Hootsuite, I used to really, really like Hootsuite. I feel like it's maybe gotten a little too complicated for its own good. So if, if you're a social media manager or you are very, very into social media, I think Hootsuite is a great tool. For people who are kind of more casual social media users, I think Buffer is, is gonna be your best bet.